that you can tell when a, a neurologist runs up to a closing elevator door, he puts his hand to stop the door. When a neurosurgeon goes over to stop the elevator door, he puts his head in. Greetings. I'm Evan Swenson. I'm a author and a book publisher. I'm also a member of Author Masterminds. Today we're having a conversation with Carl Douglas, also a member of Author Masterminds. Carl is a neurosurgeon turned author who writes with gripping realism. Hello, Carl. Greetings. It's good to be with you today. Uh, let's talk about uh, some things, Carl. Authors, uh, you, you are the uh, author mastermind's most prolific author, without a doubt. Some 28 going on 30 books. But let's start back to the beginning before you turned author. And that's when you were neurosurgeon. What is a neurosurgeon, Carl? Uh, well, let me explain a little. A neurosurgeon is a uh, surgeon who deals with all of the problems of the nervous system that are amenable to surgery. So we deal with a craniotomy, which has to do with uh, entering the head, working on the brain itself, uh, on peripheral nerves, and on the spinal cord. Now, that's a little, it's a little different now than when I first started. Uh, there are a lot more neurosurgeons than there were then. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, we did everything. We did uh, angiograms and myelograms and all kinds of tests. And uh, in my uh, learning, I learned uh, to do all of those procedures, craniotomies and back operations and that sort of thing. Now, there are not enough craniotomies to keep a neurosurgeon actively uh, up to date and with fingers that are practiced enough. So many neurosurgeons have stopped doing uh, craniotomies and are limiting their work to mostly uh, backs. Now let me mention a difference here between uh, neurologists and uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, neurologists don't operate. So let me uh, illustrate that with a little story. Uh, how do you tell the difference between the two has been explained to me by a neurologist. And he says that you can tell when a a uh, neurologist runs up to a closing elevator door. He puts his hand to stop the uh, door. When a neurosurgeon goes over to stop the elevator door, he puts his head in. Uh, so <laughs> they deem themselves to be the thinkers and we're the cutters and sewers. <laughs> that is a good story, Carl. Yeah, that is a good story. Well. So your background was uh, in neurosurgery. Now I know that uh, a little bit about you. You and I have been friends for a lot of years. And when True. I first met you, you were not Carl Douglas. And then you True. became Carl Douglas later. And in the last few years, you've kind of been a split personality between Carl Douglas and somebody else. Uh, are you open with that or? What's the deal on it? I am now. Uh, I'm uh, the reason that I uh, took a pseudonym was uh, in my uh, my book uh, Saga of a Neurosurgeon. I was delving into a lot of uh, autobiographical things. Now, I changed the names to protect the guilty, and I uh, altered where things were done and all that, but. In those pages are descriptions of some pretty terrible things done by neurosurgeons that I know or other surgeons. And uh, I wanted to tell the story, but I did not want to get 
into all the legal problems that that would potentially convey. And I think I masked them well enough for that. Now, uh, since I've gotten to be uh, uh, at my four score and 10, the uh, people that I've, uh, I could expose are mostly dead. And so I don't worry about it uh, too much anymore. Some of them have gotten their just desserts and gone to prison uh, or have uh, retired or been fired in ignominy. So that would not have been uh, so bad that I mentioned them. And so now I can largely be myself and I have a wider level of friends. I uh, finally succumbed uh, to Facebook. And so I've got to be a Doug instead of Carl there. And uh, I usually use that for talking about my books rather than showing him people how much toilet paper I was able to get from Costco or that kind of thing. So uh, uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, less intense now. So you, you're comfortable with being uh, Carl or Doug, either one? I am. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what do the, what do your children call you uh, when they refer to their dad as an author? Did they mention it as this Carl or as Doug? No, this is Papa. Papa. Okay. Papa writes books. First. Uh, yeah, and I don't even know, I don't even know they, uh, the my grandchildren knew that I was a neurosurgeon, uh, let alone an author, because they don't read that kind of books. It's not about supernatural or, or uh, great fun. Yeah, they uh, uh, are millennials and uh, they think like millennials, so that kind of uh, presents a gulf for us all. But my very first grandchild's very first word was Papa, I am proud to uh, share. And uh, I became Papa ever since. My wife became Ma uh, simply because the Mama was a little too hard for him to say. So that stuck to us. At first, she was uh, not about to admit to being anybody's ma. And I frankly uh, was gonna get my uh, grandchildren to call me uncle. But anyway, I got over it. Uh, age happens to us all. <laughs> yes, it does, Carl. It does indeed. Well, now your life as a neurosurgeon was not always in the classroom or in the hospital, but you did, you served some time in uh, Vietnam. As a general surgeon, uh, I had two, I've had a fair amount of schizophrenia in my career in life. Uh, I, I entered the Navy as a general surgeon. And you have to know a little something about me to understand this. Um, when I was doing my general surgery, uh, at the University of Minnesota, uh, you had to be very aggressive. That is, you had to steal cases uh, right and left and, and have no uh, moral qualms. And that's how I learned to do surgery. So I went into the uh, Navy and uh, entered this hospital uh, with the uh, for the CBs. And the second week I was there, the guy who was the head of surgery uh, disappeared. He became um, totally uh, absent and it was odd enough, they, they, they gave him a general discharge and not even a dishonorable discharge, but I became the chief of surgery. Now, pretty much nobody asked uh, what my training was. They just said, you know, it's the chief of surgery, so he must be you had that's the letters really behind good. your name, so that's all it took right uh -huh. then. Uh, well, it was. Nobody questioned me. And the nurses were very helpful because um, they liked me, I liked them, and they were willing to hold uh, a book open so I could follow along what I was doing, that, uh, which was the first time for me, and uh, they didn't tell on me. So I got to do an awful lot of surgery. Uh, I loved it, and it was everything from soup to nuts. I did... Uh, I delivered babies, I did autopsies, and uh, 
I did actually I did everything except neurosurgery and then they needed neurosurgeons so I stayed in and that's when I started my uh, neurosurgery on a real battleground which is Parkland Hospital in Dallas and uh -huh. anybody who knows Texas and Dallas will know exactly what I'm talking about uh -huh. for a while it was the uh, murder capital of the world or no the murder capital of the United States and then they stopped counting murders by black people and so it lost its uh, uh, great credit as being the murder capital of the states so oh, I got a lot there and then I did in the Navy I was just as busy as a one-armed paper hanger I got as many cases as I could get from every place I, I really like to do surgery well, while you were in the Navy, is that where you conceived the idea for uh, your first book that I'm familiar with that we published, and that is The Last Phoenix? Is that where that occurred? Is that where you turned author? Well, I'd hardly turned author at that point. I was, I was thinking of being an author, author even before uh, I was sort of forced into it. My first encounter, which gave me the idea for the first book, the first book is called The Last Phoenix, and it's about a um, CIA program of uh, what amounted to Murder Incorporated uh, in Vietnam. The way I ran into that was I had a, a patient who came in with uh, back pain and he was very overwrought about his back pain and it was clear to me that he uh, had a psychological problem more than he had a physical or surgical problem so we uh, sat down to talk and I asked him uh, if he'd been in the military and he said yes and he'd been a marine in Vietnam and I said and I take it that you've seen some pretty terrible things and that's uh, stayed with you and he said yeah uh, he said, I've thrown grenades uh, from troop trucks to kill children uh, who were trying to throw grenades into my truck. But you know, the worst thing I ever saw was what happened to Vietnamese civilians who were, fell into the Phoenix program. So uh, I asked him how much he knew about it. He didn't know much. And so I set out to learn about it. And when I learned about it, then that became the core of uh, my first book and let me just note that i still hadn't really written a word until uh, i developed blindness in my left eye from a retinal detachment and on friday that happened and on monday i had to cancel all of my cases and never did another one uh, i lost all stereoscopic vision so I had to do something, I had to use my brain, which was still functioning pretty well. And so I, I did one thing I really did enjoy, which was research. And I learned everything I could about that program. I even uh, went to visit some of the former members in it who were as bitter a people as I had ever seen. And so I put that into my uh, book. In the last Some Phoenix, things. yeah, and that in the last Phoenix and other books, there's it's not always nice. Uh, almost nothing about kittens and puppies. Well, <laughs> so uh, if I understand what your story earlier said, when you was talking to this uh, young man who had been in Vietnam and introduced you to the the Phoenix program, mm -hmm. there you. Uh, Put, you would have put your hand in the elevator or your head in the elevator. Sounds like you were putting both hand and head in the elevator. You got on. Well, in that case, I was going to be protecting my head. So I would have been more like the neurologists. Nice people, but they can't operate. Oh. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I need to interview one of perfect. them, don't I? So let's, let's talk about then, uh, Carl, uh, this gripping realism. Neurosurgeon turned author writes with gripping realism. 
Yeah, you know, I've read supernatural books. I have read uh, literature books, which are uh, poetic prose. Uh, I have written uh, books by Christian novelists, and I just can't do that. Uh, I have uh, this sort of hardwired, hard look at uh, life and stories. My uh, adventures, if you want to call it that, uh, in Parkland Hospital were such that I worked 120 hours a week, which is now illegal. Uh, and the usual uh, neurosurgeon now uh, is required, but not often gets there to do 300 craniotomies, and I did 3,000. We, we simply had to deal with the worst things that you can see. We saw the stuff that went bump in the night. And uh, there are many days when I didn't get to sleep uh, for two and three days. And so I would do just like all the rest of the residents. Uh, I would have a few minutes and I'd lie down on the floor in the hallway and just go to sleep. Now that wasn't much of a problem because we didn't have any furniture at uh, Parkland Hospital. The nice patient stole it all. Anyway, uh, I looked at things you know, I saw all kinds of dead people. I saw people who had been murdered in the most vicious of ways, people who had been bombed. And uh, I just got to the point where I could handle it all. I, uh, when I worked as a deaner, I bought myself a little tube of uh, mentholatum and rubbed it under my nose so that uh, at least uh, that sense would not be assaulted. And I just got used to that, and I got used to telling stories that are detailed. And I think many of the world's problems are gripping ones. There's someone who has to get up in the night to do the things that the people who are home at sleep just couldn't bear to see or couldn't bear to do. And that's the kind of stories that have settled into my mind. Well, these my wife aren't... has a real hard time reading my books. Now, these aren't. Uh... Uh, ghost stories are uh, they're not uh, that you write about are they're not uh, I guess they're fiction but how much of it's fiction Carl and how much is real you talk about the uh, hospital that you worked in I, I mean uh, I can't imagine the things that you've seen and done and uh, you'd write those so, so gripping to me why I don't know that I'd want to read them so, uh, you sound like you... my, my wife. <laughs> uh, we're well, talk... let me tell you that. Yeah, go ahead. Saga of a neurosurgeon uh, is story. However, the things that happened are altogether real. Uh, about 90% of them I either participated in or uh, witnessed. Other stories are. Uh, things that I studied about and got down to the uh, really nitty gritty of it all. Uh, an example of that, uh, I, I wrote a book called The Charlemagne Murders because my son said, uh, Dad, did you know that there was a uh, French uh, legion that uh, joined uh, en masse the uh, SS of Hitler. They were so converted and convinced that they were the last regiment that uh, uh, was associated with the Nazis in the Battle of Berlin, the last battle of the war. And no, I didn't know a thing about it, so I studied it. And I learned a lot about this French Charlemagne regiment, but more than that, I learned about what went on in the aftermath of the Second World War and a lot of things that America and the Allies should not be proud of. The treatment of the POWs was absolutely terrible. Uh, we linked right up with the Russians. 
And I thought that was worth telling. And I thought it was worth telling uh, in black and white, with not a lot of shades of gray. So if I was to read that, uh, and anyone read it, they, they would know that the story's there, but the facts are true. That the Russians- And if they called had... me on the phone, I'd tell them absolutely. Really? Okay. And they can look it up too. Yeah. You, you know, these, these things are not big secrets. It's just that the victors uh, got to do the writing and they didn't write about this stuff. That's always the case, isn't it? The, the, the victors yeah. is the one that writes the history of the war. Mm -hmm. yeah. Except historians who sneak and pick up the rocks or lift up the scabs and see what's underneath. And that's the kind of stuff I like to write about. Everybody knows that uh, we won the war and we were glorious heroes, but I think it's a little more interesting to find out what went on behind the scenes. Uh, what uh, the powers that be, the, the WAMs, that's the wise old men, did not want to have uh, put out. They want to have this uh, concept of America as being pretty nice, a little more like puppies and kittens. And I write about the attack dogs and the sheep dogs. Well, so, uh, uh, Carl, uh, you are obviously an American, and... Uh, I am. And... Uh, Flag we, waver. <laughs> and so, are you now saying that uh, you're not a proud American, or you are a proud American? I'm not sure I understand what you just said. Explain that. Well, I'm, I am both proud and informed. Uh, I am a Christian, but I know a lot about... Uh, the dark ages of Christianity, Inquisition and all those things, uh, but I'm still a Christian. I believe in the United States. I believe it has uh, some work to do, but I'm patriotic and uh, uh, when the uh, opportunity was offered me, uh, I was drafted but I went. Now, let me just explain a little bit. You, you asked a good question. Um, when I went to uh, uh, California, as the CB base, and, and I became the uh, chief of surgery, we had a very unusual arrangement there. This was during the very heavy protests, and there were uh, four other surgeons and a, uh, an anesthesiologist who were inducted in at the same time I was. Uh, every one of them refused to operate because this was a wicked war and the United States was bad and, and uh, they let their hair grow down to the middle of their backs and they didn't shave. And, and uh, I learned uh, at that point in time by in fact, a uh, face-to-face -face meeting with the Admiral, uh, the CNO, uh, and he said, oh, that's okay. You just take care of your duties and let them go. And he didn't kick them out or anything. So since I like to do surgery, uh, I did the thing. I could have done the same thing. I could have just said, oh, I hate what we're doing there and I'm not gonna do it. Well, I did because I thought that people deserved to be operated on. So I delivered babies. Uh, we had obstetricians. I did. I set bones that were broken, and we had orthopedic surgeons. Uh, I did uh, autopsies. We could have sent out, uh, but I saved uh, money. Anyway, uh, I worked long and hard because I believed in America. I believed what the CBs were doing. You know, the CBs are the the guys who. Uh, in the Second World War, got onto the beaches first, and they would plant a little sign for the Marines to read when they came on, and it says, this beach compliments of the CBs, welcome Marines. So that's the kind of people that I thought were, the can-do people. And <laughs> they can do for America, and I did. I, I'm not naive though, 
So, uh, <laughs> Carl, I've never heard that story. I thought you was going to say that they planted the sign that says Kilroy was here. <laughs> no, there, Kilroy no. was Kilroy was a Marine thing, then became a an Army thing, and that was after they kind of passed through. This was a welcome to start getting shot at. So the CBs were who, Carl? I thought they were sailors that just hauled freight. No, uh, the uh, construction, the mobile construction battalions, CBs. Um, have a, a little um, insignia that they wear, which is a armed bee with a little sailor hat on, and the bee is carrying a Tommy gun and a shovel. Uh, and that's that's the sea bees, and that's exactly what they were. They were a tough bunch. They did get in a lot of our fights and trouble, and I had to go help them out with that. Uh, one of one of my jobs while I was there was I was the brig doctor, so I had to go and uh, uh, actually defend the Marines who'd gotten the tar beat out of them by the guards, and that was one of my big fights. I, I sort of uh, fashioned or uh, allowed myself to be a fighter uh, because I thought things that were wrong. That's kind of what I did in my uh, books. But the things I saw that were wrong were these poor 18 year olds who had been beaten half to death because they were uh, absent without leave for two hours. And so I took that to Washington as well and they changed it. The, uh, they just couldn't beat them with impunity anymore. And they hated the brig officers, hated to see me come. So they had to clean people up and make sure they didn't have any bruises. <laughs> oh, Carl. So uh, you've had some some horrible experiences, but I know you've had, uh, it's been gratifying to you to see things happen. But let's talk about- it's always interesting. Say again? It's always interesting. That, that's one of the big things, yeah. worth, of a, worth a story. Well, I want to ask you in a minute, what's the most interesting case you ever had as a doctor? But before we ask that question, I want to talk about today's world. Right now, we're, uh, we're plagued with the uh, coronavirus and everyone's got that on their mind. And we're talking about doctors and nurses. And I've seen a lot of stuff on the internet that prays and, uh, the doctors and nurses, and but then there's some that are not so complimentary. Uh, in your mind, as an ex experienced uh, neurosurgeon, you've been down the road. What do you have to say about today's uh, medical people that are treating us every day for the coronavirus and everything else on top of it? Great question, and uh, let me go back a little earlier um, to tell you about uh, something uh, of the character of these kind of people. Uh, after I could no longer operate, but didn't have any money, I uh, went to work at the Utah State Mental Hospital. And uh, I admired the nurses more than any other people that I had ever met. These little girls, I mean, look, I'm old. Everybody's a little girl to me that isn't 60. And I watched them take terrible abuse. They had physical attacks. They were called the most filthy names. They were, they had uh, sexual assaults perpetrated against them. And now, this is smiled. by their patients that have done that? Not by the patients. Yeah, not, not me or the, the doctors. Uh -huh. No, I, I refrain from such. They uh, were not really protected by their system either. There's an organization called NAMI, uh, National Organization of the Mentally Ill, and they have a set of rules that would make uh, a uh, Catholic m monk wince. Uh, it's very difficult. If they're attacked, they can't fight back is the concept. When I worked there, I uh, 
participated in a couple of riots and I worried about uh, what I was going to do uh, when I was in the riot because I wasn't allowed, allowed, going to allow myself to get uh, beaten into a nerveless pulp. So we had this one particular riot and in it I, I knew some jiu-jitsu so I uh, threw patients. I did a hip throw, put them on the ground and then uh, Afterwards, I talked to the security guard who it's okay for them. And I said, well, what do you put in your report when you uh, do that sort of thing? He says, oh, that's easy now. Repeat after me. I assisted the patient to the floor. So that was how I filled out my reports. But we, you know, I took a fair amount of abuse, but the nurses were angels. So what do I think about these people? Uh, who are facing death. Uh, the masks they wear, the gowns they wear are not good enough and they're getting uh, diseased and they're dying. And China is full of people who died and so is Italy. So uh, what do I think about them? Uh, I don't think there's a sports hero in the world uh, or a movie star hero that uh, deserves any such appellation as hero. All of them do. They leave their families. They've got to find somebody to take care of their families. They have to go through huge rigmarole rituals when they come home, strip off all their clothes, wash them before they can greet people. They wash themselves thoroughly, and then they collapse into bed because they're exhausted. Those are my heroes. Uh, and I think everybody in the world owes a great debt of gratitude. I feel the same way about the, the other first responders. They're going into harm's way. Okay, so another thing, uh, since you got me wound up here. Uh, this morning, I looked on the news and I saw a line of people uh, stretching around the entrance to a uh, Costco. Those people were jammed uh, back to back and shoulder to shoulder, six feet, no, they're, they were practically on top of each other. Uh, and they're going in there to buy, and, and this is a fact because they showed this uh, on their videos, to buy more toilet paper than they could carry out on one cart and uh, the two people buying the stuff holding it enough toilet paper to last them until 2089. And uh, then they can be certainly secure in that regard. They have used up, they, the people who go to those places, have used up all the masks. There is not a mask or a roll of toilet paper in my town. Uh, and I think that's utter foolishness. And that's the world that the angel doctors and nurses are putting up with and thank the good Lord for them. Wow, that is scary, isn't it, uh, Carl? Uh, but uh, yeah, just, we better we better wise up and and uh, fly right, or a lot more of us are not going to fly at all. Well, just don't go stand in that line at Costco, uh, Carl. You can get <laughs> on me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what we'll do for for a mask. Yeah. Uh, tear up our sheets, I guess, and they'll last a day. <laughs> just don't go where you need a mask. <laughs> yeah, well, I got a good wife and we can talk with each other and, and I got stuff to do here. I can write. Yeah. Uh, and yes, in you fact, can. it's been great. All, I get almost no interruptions except by the, the full crank telephone calls, uh, one of which was interrupting us earlier. Uh, so all in all, it's not been half bad for me. I have a question about Dr. Hooker. Uh, I knew a Dr. Hooker, Keith Hooker. Keith Hooker, same guy. Yeah. And they and he is related to General Hooker of the Civil War. Yeah, uh, Keith, Keith is a great, fascinating guy. Well, the, uh, the Keith Hooker I know was uh, killed in an airplane crash, I think, over Provo, Utah. Small airplane. Yep. He, well, he did a lot of uh, emergency work using his plane and going places. Right. Uh, uh, pick him up. 
he was also, uh, as we all refer to him, a wild honyot. Uh, he was fearless. Not a lot of people have fears and they're brave. He was fearless. He just did everything uh, that he wanted to do and thought possible for him to do. And he was a genuine doctor. He was a very neat guy. I think that this is a kind of a good place to end this discussion, uh, Carl. Uh, and with the idea that, well, I want to come back. I want to hear some more. I mean, I've known you for a long time. I've never heard these stories. I want to hear some more. But it's interesting that both you and Keith Hooker have been in my home in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, yeah. I didn't know about Keith, but I've been, yeah. I've been there, which... Uh, that meeting with you, or a couple meetings, sold me, and uh, I worked hard to sell myself to you, uh, and all the rest is history, you know, the 30 books or whatever it is later, and actually I've got three of them going right now. Uh, during this time, writing has been wonderful for me. I, it soothes me, I can ventilate about the things that don't lie, I can get teary-eyed about the things I do like uh, and uh, uh, I have a real emotional attachment to my books. I like to feel them. I like to look at that nice print and all those wonderful covers that your uh, artists make. Anyway, writing Carl, is uh, great. Carl, thank you for this conversation. It's been really enlightening and entertaining and uh, it's just been nice. Uh, we'll do this again. Well, I don't know if it's been nice, but it's been, it has been great. And I did enjoy it. I probably have some nice story to tell, I'll think. <laughs> Carl, uh, it has been nice. Uh, and we'll do this again. Uh, but uh, let's uh, save some of those stories for another t time. But in the meantime, Carl, keep in touch.